Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Town Peterson, um, and I have the the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker to you today. Um, Ali and I have been working together for what about seven years now. Uh, I got to work with him since his master's degree, um, which I co-supervised with uh, while he was still in Iran at the Isfahan University of Technology. And then Ali came to KU in 2015. And here we are five years later. Um, he is He's ready to move on to his next stop in his career. Um, Ali has, has accumulated three major publications, um, one which he led on, on inventory statistics, published in PeerJ, uh, one which you're going to hear about, which was his first chapter of his dissertation, and one where, where he was a co-author, um, but also on topics related to his dissertation. Uh, you'll hear about that as well. He has a couple more papers in review. Um, where Ali has been um, pretty impressive is in writing proposals. Um, he wrote a major proposal to the National Geographic Society, um, and, um, helped me to write a major proposal to the, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, wasn't funded, but it was a pretty powerful proposal. And then uh, he led development of one entire work packet of a major proposal to NSF uh, a year and a half ago, and the $4 million grant was funded. And since then, Ali has been leading the, the uh, automated identification section of that proposal, which was focused on, on ticks. Uh, and that's really the, the uh, part of that project that has made the most progress. And, and when Ali is not finishing up his dissertation, he's writing that paper uh, that, that comes out of that, um, of that pro project. Uh, and in fact, this week, Ali is, is submitting another major NSF proposal. Um, this is a, a collaborative proposal with Stanford University and it essentially would create his, his uh, postdoc into the future, but it would be to create a um, monitoring network of, of um, automated identification of bird songs at automated recorders across Mexico. Uh, most immediately, however, Ali has been offered and has accepted uh, position as a postdoctoral researcher at Colorado State University, where he'll be working with automating uh, identifications of bats. So um, that's the factual stuff. Um, more importantly is it's been great having Ali in my group of students, and um, he's been a, a good friend and a, and a good companion the last half decade except when there's a ping pong paddle involved, which is when this other uh, personality comes out. But other than that, he's a nice guy. And I hope you will enjoy his presentation. So Ali, it's all yours. Well, thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Tao. Uh, I should apologize for the moments that I'm not behaving really well over the ping pong. I'm gonna share my screen for uh, the presentation about my dissertation and I need some kind of like adjustment here. Okay, so can everyone see that? Yes. Perfect. So today uh, I would like to talk about my dissertation and the research that I've done over the past five years and still need some adjustment. Uh, I would like to give you an outline about the, uh, the, the topics that I'm going to cover in today's talk. I'm going to start uh, with background information about like the importance of uh, designing automated species identification systems and the models that we use for those systems, which are deep neural networks. 
uh, why we use them and how they work. And then uh, I'm gonna start talking about the three chapters of my dissertation. And at the end, I'm gonna mention some cool ideas regarding the, uh, the future applications of deep learnings with uh, complex biological questions. So, to start with the background, like uh, everyone here, I mean, uh, otherwise you wouldn't be here, everyone uh, cares about biodiversity conservation. And for most of the biologists, they uh, deeply know about the current situation of uh, extinction of a species that we are right now in the middle of the sixth um, mass extinction. And over the past 100 years, the, the rate of the species extinction has gone up uh, exponentially. And you can see it here on the, uh, the, the, right ax the right axis of the graph, the, the taxa that we are losing uh, over the past 100 years. Also, in addition to that problem, and as we all know that over, the, over every 24 hours, we are losing about uh, 150 to 200 species. And there's another issue is the gap of the knowledge that we have about some species, uh, in particular for invertebrates, that there's a huge gap between the number of species that we know and they are described and they're known uh, versus the number of species that we predict are out there, but we have no information about them. And the thing, the main point here is that if we don't know what we are supposed to conserve, and we have no information about them, we cannot develop uh, approaches that are efficient enough for, for that purpose. So uh, one major challenge uh, with regards of uh, improving that gap that I showed you here is the, that there's a whole package, they call them taxonomic impediments, and that uh, mentions like uh, issues that we have with identification process of a species that includes the, for example, uh, the, the training or the ex uh, experiences that we have, uh, some, some experts have, and it's not available to everyone or the resources that we have for, for this process and like the, the wordings, the, the, all of those resources are not either understandable or available to public or um, other researchers for improving the identification process. And it needs a high level of training and experience that you would be able to complete this process of uh, describing and identifying species. Uh, that's why over the past couple of decades, uh, researchers have started proposing solutions and one of the major uh, solutions that they were thinking of is designing automated species identifications to kind of automate this process and avoid overwhelming researchers and taxonomists with the work that they have through the identification of the species. And we know like in most of the collections around the world, we have many specimens that uh, I mean, collection managers or, or researchers collected them. They are sitting there, but they, don't, they are overwhelmed with the other important tasks that they have, and they, are not, they don't have the time to go through them and find if there are new species or also identify the species that they're already described. So for using like those automated identification systems, one of the uh, set of machine learning algorithms that recent, recently have been focused on are deep learning. Also, I like to show you this graph because sometimes we use these terms interchangeably and it's good to show the differences between them that deep learning is a set of algorithms below the, the umbrella of machine learning algorithms and all of them together are a subgroup of artificial intelligence. I'm going to show you one of the examples that they develop an automated species identification system for bird species. And here you can see the, that on real time, the camera or the system behind camera is identifying the species and also counting the number of individuals coming in front of the camera. And that's designed by American Museum of Natural History. And another example that uh, almost all of you are familiar with that or probably have used it uh, in the past is that is iNaturalist. It's an application that you install on your phone and you uh, take a picture of any species 
that you don't know about it or you want to identify them and you upload the picture and the deep learning system behind that identify those species for you. One of the other aspects of using deep learning techniques uh, is that in the past, when we were using traditional machine learning algorithms that are, if you remember that, that diagram that I show you, that part of that was deep learning and the other part of that is other machine learning algorithms, we refer to them here as traditional machine learning algorithms. In the past, if we wanted to develop a model for each task, we needed to develop separate models for separate tasks. But thanks to deep learning algorithms, now we can develop a model for task A and then transfer the knowledge that we gained or the experience that we gained from that model to model B that is, supposed, that is responsible for task B. So here you can see the green area is the, is the transferred knowledge that we have from model A. And here is the trainable area associated with the data that we have from task B. And this is the technique that we call transfer learning. So for, for my dissertation, I use a, a, a deep learning software named TensorFlow. It's an open, open source software and it provides the opportunity that we can apply uh, transfer learning techniques. We use the, the one that is written in Python, the Python version. We uh, install it on a, we implement it on a virtual machine named Docker and using an operating system, uh, Linux. So the deep learning technique that we used is Inception V3. Again, designed by a Google Brain team, implemented in TensorFlow, and uh, it's a CNN. CNN are the uh, convolutional neural networks. There are a subset, a subgroup of the uh, deep neural networks. They are specialized, they're kind of like the special forces for image recognition and pattern recognition. They are usually uh, deep in terms of the number of the layers. And here you can see that they have 48 layers. And uh, I'm sorry for the sound. Uh, this is my chance. Like the, when I had the, uh, my postdoc interview, it was right at the time that they wanted to cut the glasses and now again the time. So CNN, this CNN that I'm using here, to, uh, transfer learning has 48 layers. And you can see here that all of these layers are already pre-trained on 1 million images from ImageNet. And what we do is taking the last layer of the, of the model and train it on our own data set. And that's what we call transfer learning or the knowledge that we transfer to our system regarding the task that we have. Okay, so that was a brief uh, in, uh, introduction about why automated species identification systems are important and also why we need to use deep neural networks regarding the efficiency that they have. So I'm gonna talk about my first chapter. And as you can see, we have two sections the first chapter is gonna be based on morphology-based identification, which is we taking images of specimens and we identify them using morphology. I really want to thank uh, people who helped me so much with, with this chapter, especially Ed Com for, uh, uh, for the computational part of that and also suggesting uh, the uh, applying transfer learning techniques. Rodrigo, who is an entomologist, a, medical entomologist, an expert in uh, the, Chag the Brazilian Chagas disease vectors, and Janine, that also a medical entomologist, an expert in Chagas disease vectors in Mexico. So the reason we chose Chagas disease, is a very important disease across the Americas. It's, uh, it has a, it's uh, caused by a parasite and transmitted by triatomines. There are bugs that they bite you and they transmit the parasite to you and then that causes the, inf uh, the infection, the disease. And that's a serious problem to public health of the countries that are struggling with this disease. And as you can see, it's responsible for 10,000 deaths per year. When I arrived at KU, I got involved in this project. Uh, uh, we were designing a virtual vector lab using traditional classifiers to identify Chagas disease vectors in Brazil and Mexico. And that was the project that got me into this question with the help like uh, with working with Edcom to later explore 
applying ten, uh, deep learning techniques to improve these results. So I'm going to give you kind of introduction information about uh, this this project because it's a base of the of my first chapter. For that project, we designed an apparatus to take a standardized images from the bugs that we have from the specimens. And the reason for that was because traditional classifiers uh, were not uh, able to, to be introduced with a lot of variation across the images. And we wanted to have more standard images that we can improve the identification. And the image that we take from those apparatus is the original image, images like that. And then we design a program to convert those images to E and add landmarks. And uh, this pro we kind of like process images for, for uh, our classifiers because that improved the classification. And here we add the landmarks on the uh, body of the bug. And then we measure those landmarks and take the ratio of them to identify those species using, uh, using the morphology or the geometry of the, of the species. Here are the results that we achieved using uh, traditional classifiers. As you can see, the, the two charts here are showing the, the numbers within the chart are the number of species that we could identify with these ranges. And as we have a bigger uh, green area, we would be happier with the result. You can see the Brazilian species had a better uh, identification rate over than Mexican species. Okay, so that was the introduction of that project, which was the uh, base for the project for my first chapter that we applied uh, deep learning. So we used deep learning and the, uh, the paper was published in the Journal of Medical Entomology to see if we can improve the results that we achieve, already achieved using traditional classifiers. Here is the workflow that I followed for for my first chapter, and you're gonna see this picture uh, a couple of more times through the uh, presentation. We use those images that I showed you without the background to, to create an image reference library. And after that, using the cross-validation techniques, we created two sets of data, training set and test set. And using training set, we parameterize the, uh, the model, TensorFlow. And I know town doesn't like this spelling here, but it shouldn't have E. And we had this conversation, but he doesn't like it. But it's not, it's not wrong, that's, that's correct. So we parameterized TensorFlow using training set, and we evaluated over the test set that we have, and after, because they have independent images here, and then we calculate the correct identification rate. One of the parameters that we uh, can, uh, kind of be adjusted or we work on that is training set. Here you can see on the left side of the, uh, the plot, you can see the success rate. On the x-axis, we have training steps and on the right side, we have the processing time. So we have started trying different training steps, as you can see the, the black dots, and we measured the processing time for each of those training sets. And anywhere we see the biggest gap, we consider that for the optimum number of training set for using on, on those species. And we did the same thing for Brazilians, but because we had more classes with Brazilian species, we were 39 species versus 12 Mexican species. So we had to go up with the number of training steps here. The same plot, all the axes are the same. Okay. If you remember, I showed you that plot, and I said we have 12 Mexican species. The overall identification rate was almost 75%, and you can see the number of species within each range of the identification. This is the result that we achieved using TensorFlow. We improved the overall identification rate over the 12 species by 8%. We also increased significantly the green area associated with our identification. For Brazilian species, the same format. Uh, this is the result that we achieved using uh, the traditional classifiers. And here is the difference. As you can see, the overall identification rate didn't increase as, as much that we had for Mexican species. But what was like significantly different was the number of species that we could increase to, to this level 
the, to get them hired to the uh, identification of the Bob Knight person. Another achievement we have from this project, we have a group of uh, haplogroup, there are, there are three haplogroups of the same species. Uh, before that, experts considered them indistinguishable morphologically, and then we use the traditional classifiers and we were able to identify them with 76 person. And the only way that they used to distinguish them was uh, the, using the sequency for se sequencing for my mitochondrial DNAs. But now with using TensorFlow, we are able to tell these three groups apart by 86 person on average identification rate. Another thing about the classification process is that if you have a lower number of classes to compare for the model, we would achieve a higher identification rate. Here, we, we have a graph. Again, on the left side, we have the sixes rate. On the x-axis, we have the number of species. This line is showing the average number of the identification rates for Mexican species, and this line is for Brazilian species. So we have started having subset of species using distributional information associated with each species to create subgroups of the species to reduce this number and improve the identification rate. And as you can see, we have like 12 species per comparison. That's around the range of the identification. And as we decrease the number of the species, the identification rate goes above 95%. And for Brazilians, almost 100%. Another thing regarding the first chapter is that I show you this picture and I said the program was converting this image to this image. But uh, the thing that I, I would like to tell you about that is that this process that probably looks simple, it took about a year of work from a very smart computer uh, software developers to develop all of those landmarks and kind of like uh, making everything perfect for the classifier. And we use these images for TensorFlow to measure the identification rate. But later, we decided to use the original images to see how, would, how well TensorFlow would perform uh, with images that are not processed. And that's the, the identification rate that we achieved here, which is 82.9%. So basically, for TensorFlow, it doesn't matter if we process the images or we don't process them the identification would be around the same rate. Okay, so as I showed, uh, uh, deep learning technique, uh, the, uh, our deep learning model could improve identifications that we already achieved using uh, traditional classifiers significantly. We also tried it with uh, raw images and we achieved almost the same identification rate. And also this uh, TensorFlow was great in telling the cryptic species apart and kind of like showing the understanding the differences between those three haplogroups. Okay, so that was my first chapter and the only example that I brought here that we use morphology to identify the species. For the second chapter and the third chapter, we decided to change a little bit of the inputs that we had for our deep learning model, which is instead of using the morphology, the pictures of the specimens, we use the pictures of the signals that are made by those species that we are focusing on. And for the second chapter, I really like, I want to acknowledge the, the help and the great advices that they received from Joanna and Rafe throughout this project. Joanna helped a lot with understanding the behavior and also Rafe like, provided valuable information uh, regarding the calls plus the data for this, for this chapter. The two questions we designed for this chapter is that first, if TensorFlow can identify uh, frog species, just using a various images showing or representing simple acoustic features of their calls, which are the made calls. And also we wanna go one step further and see if we have new species that are not present in our reference library, can TensorFlow detect them, or at least show some signals to flag the, uh, the kind of existence of a new species? 
the reason we chose Philippines, as all as you all know, it's a biodiversity hotspot. Uh, actually, it this country ranks first in terms of the amphibian endemism and platymentus. The genus has has is a very large group of uh, endemic species. Uh, thanks to Rave, his colleagues, and his students, we have a high rate of the species discovery in this area. And also another reason was we had a wonderful uh, data from the recordings of those frog species by Rave and his colleagues that we can apply these models to. As I told you in the past, I'm going to show you this workflow. This part uh, is exactly the same. Uh, we follow the same procedures for the first chapter. But these part are the two extra steps that we added to our workflow because we were working with signals, which is we clipped single notes, we created a sound, a sound reference library, and then we converted the sounds to images to get to this uh, stage that I already explained to you. Here is a, is a call for, for a platinum mantis ISER. I'm just gonna play it for you. I will tell you why I'm gonna show you this, this picture. Okay, as you can see, that, that part of the call introduces a lot of information, has valuable information regarding, re, uh, regarding the species and also those like pauses and for identifying one species. But what we did for this project was just clipping one single node and removing all other information we have our, some reasons regarding the sample size that we need for our uh, deep learning models. So I'm gonna show you more, but this is, this is a single note of that species that I just played for you. So you can see the differences between a pattern versus a single note. Here I'm showing you another example for Levigatus that you can see the information that appears here if you wanted to use the pattern, but we, have, we just decided to use a single note and change them to images for the spectrograms. So I'm gonna play that single note for you. Another example, this is an undescribed species. You can see the pattern here and here the single note. So we clip the single notes of 20 species that we had in our data set and we kind of like use the same ranges uh, for, for the, the spectrograms, which is the, the y axis of each spectrogram is the frequency rate, and all of them are between 1 to 5.5 kilohertz, and the x axis is the time length, which is only one second. Here are the results that we uh, achieved using TensorFlow on, the, on 20 species we use and the overall identification rate is 94 percent here again the numbers within the chart are the number of the species more than half of the species were identified with a hundred percent correct identification rate as you can see the other range of the colors and identification rates then as we did for the first chapter we wanted to improve our identification rate and we added the information, the distributional information regarding the islands that those species co-occur to create a subset of species that we can improve our uh, identification rate with lower classes to, classes to compare. And as you see, the overall correct identification rate across all islands was almost 99%. Okay, for the second question, I would like to get help from two good friends of mine that are very successful biologists to show you an example that what do I mean when I want uh, our deep learning model flag or signal appearance of a novel species. So I decided to name two classifiers after these two good friends of mine. One of the classifiers, the name is Fernando and the other classifier is Pietro. Fernando is an ornithologist, is very interested in birds specifically the crested or a pendula. And he, like every morning he starts his day with say, checking the pictures of new or a pendula. And also Pietro, I hope Pietro you like the picture that they chose here. 
So he's very interested in green and all. So I decided to create two classifiers named Fernando and Pietro, and then I'm gonna uh, train Fernando and Pietro on 100 images associated with these three species to see how they would perform as classifiers if we show them new images of the same species for identification. Here, as you can see, Fernando could identify 97 images associated with these three species and has 7% higher rate compared to Pietro that, has, that could only identify 90 images. But for the second question, we needed to uh, give another challenge to these two classifiers. So it depends on the species that you are working. If they are not very concerning, I mean, the importance of the species are not that high, seven person is not very significant. But if you are, for example, working with a species concerning to public health, or they are medically important, this seven person would be very significant in our identification. For the next step, I decided to choose this very cool salamander. It's a endemic species, as the name is showing, the Loristan mute is an endemic species in Iran, in Zagros Mountain, and I'm sure like uh, Rafe would be really excited about seeing this species. And so this is an endemic species. This is not lizard, this is not a gray wolf, also this is not a bird. But I decided to give this picture to our two classifiers to see how they would perform with a with picture of a new species that is not part of the reference library. I showed that to Fernando and I asked it to identify that. Fernando got back to me, said this is an aura pendula, and I'm damn sure that this is a bird. I asked Pietro to give me an answer and he said, well, I think this is a lizard or an owl, but I'm not actually very sure about it. And that, that's the certainty rate that Pietro gave me versus the certainty rate that Fernando gave me. So what I hear, what I'm seeing here is that uh, the problem with the Fernando classifier was that not only couldn't find the closest guess in the reference library regarding this species, also it was very certain about the wrong identification that, had, that Fernando had. But the fact is that Fernando and Pietro must be wrong because they've never been trained on salamander images. But what I was hoping to see was like Pietro that show me a lower certainty rate for the identification. So that's why, that's what we did with TensorFlow, that we train our TensorFlow on those 20 species that I showed you already the results. And we ask TensorFlow or we applied it to a new data set containing 21 new species and one species that is already in our reference library. And then we decided to check the certainty rate to measure the performance of TensorFlow. Three things we are expecting here. First, the species that is in the reference library should be ident identified correctly by TensorFlow with a high certainty rate. The second one, which is there are first two. First, identify the species that pres are, is present in the reference library, show a high certainty rate regarding that species. Also, definitely TensorFlow is going to be wrong about the other 21 species, but we are hoping to see a low certainty rate regarding those green balls that show that they are new to the reference library. Here again, I show you that TensorFlow was able to identify those species 90, with 94%. And that one is, so this is the, the reference library. And here is the result that we achieved by TensorFlow. It's a comparison of the certainty rates here. And this is the species number eight that you can see here. So here we have two histograms. The Y axis is the certainty rate in person. And the, the X axis is the number of species, the, the name of the species. As you can see, the certainty rate for species that are in the reference library, the average is 83.5 percent. And also you can hear, you can hear, see the no, species number eight, which is 98 percent the certainty. Also TensorFlow was able to identify all spectrograms associated with the species number eight correctly. So identification of the species number eight was 100 percent certainty rate regarding species number eight was 98%. And as you can see, 
uh, TensorFlow showed a very significantly lower certainty rate compared to reference library for new species. So actually TensorFlow was able to uh, answer to all three questions that we had. Okay, the conclusion part. As we show, TensorFlow was uh, successful in identifying the 20 species that we had in our reference library. We also flagged encounter with new species by showing lower certainty rates. And after uh, incorporating uh, distributional information, we could increase the identification rate to 99, 98%. Okay, so I brought you an example from the morphology-based identification, one example from the uh, signal-based identification, and this one also is gonna be in the category of signal-based identification, but with a different, a major different compared to chapter two, which is we decided to explore the, the potential and ability of these models for, as a, as a pilot study, to see how those models would do with citizen science-based project for mosquito surveillance. And I would really like to thank the identification team that helped me with identifying mosquitoes that we collected uh, over the two seasons. Uh, so we used TensorFlow, we applied it to lower quality uh, recordings that we had compared to chapter two. The two questions we had again was that, is TensorFlow able to discriminate among mosquitoes based on the spectrograms that we have? And the second one was that, if we introduce potential invasive species to our reference library, is TensorFlow able to detect them or not? Well, we are almost around the end of the summer and if you are not already sick by the mosquitoes, you probably live in a very great place and you shouldn't think about moving. But as you know, mosquitoes are not only annoying, but also they are vectors of several different diseases and those diseases are bad. And I know some of you have already experienced some of those diseases. So the reason we chose uh, the signals from mosquitoes and not their morphology, as of course morphology would help for identification of the species, but as you can see, the signals are species specific and also gender specific. As I show you here in this video that the left individual is a female and the right individual is a male and you can clearly see the frequency of the wings uh, in this video. Here, the equipment we decided to choose because it was like exploring the possibilities of a citizen science project, we decided to use inexpensive equipment that you can uh, find them on Amazon or Walmart. We, we tried dry, dry ice to attract some mosquitoes. We used Ziploc bag. We also had uh, the, the, those cute nets that Spencer is showing in this picture and a vial for having the mosquitoes. And the process that we use for catching mosquitoes, like actually catching mosquitoes is a lot of work and I really need to thank all those people that helped me and they accepted to come out with me in the sticky weather that we have in Kansas during the two mosquito season that we collect mosquitoes. We collected about 300 individuals from 15 different species. And what we did, we catch them with those nets and then we put them into the vial and then we transfer them from the vial to the Ziploc bags and then we inflate the bags to take them to a quiet place and use cell phones to record them. And here is the workflow that we have for this project. Most part of that is similar to the second chapter because it's again signal processing. And so here you can see that we have mosquito recordings we clip the wing bits, create a sound reference library, and convert them to image reference library. But because we were, we were working with lower quality spectrograms, we did one additional uh, data cleaning process here that actually removed, the, reduced the number of the species we had from 15 species to six species. Out of those six species, four of them were uh, local species in Kansas, uh, Douglas County. The 
uh, Avis albopictus, trivitatus, quadrimaculitis, and ciliata. And here I'm showing you their images, and these pictures that you see here are their spectrograms. On the left, uh, on the y-axis, we have the frequency distribution from 0.1 to 1.1. And on the uh, x-axis, we have the time length, which is one second. And then we apply TensorFlow to identify those recordings. And as you can see, the overall identification rate is 86.3%. And the only challenging species was 80s albopictus. Later, as we did uh, with frog species, we wanted to challenge TensorFlow with two novel species that are not present in the reference library. So we assume that we have two invasive species or potential invasive species, Anopheles gambiae, which is the vector of malaria, and Aedes aegypti, that is a vector of dengue fever or yellow fever or Zika. And then we ask TensorFlow to identify them. Of course, TensorFlow is gonna be wrong because these two species are not part of the reference library, but what we are hoping to see is a lower certainty rate. However, unfortunately, that didn't happen. Here, TensorFlow, uh, at the frog project, TensorFlow behaved like Pietro classifier that showed lower uh, certainty rate. But here, what TensorFlow was doing was acting like Fernando classifier when it's encountered with a uh, novel species, showing a very high certainty rates. To solve that issue, we decided to, uh, to add those two species to the reference library. And then we applied TensorFlow again on all uh, six species together. And the bad news was that still Aedes aegypti and Alba pictus are challenging to TensorFlow. However, another potential invasive species, Anopheles gambiae, well, we were able to identify that with 100% correct identification rate. The conclusion that for this chapter was uh, if we add species, the potential invasive species to the reference library, we can solve the issue uh, that we had with the high certainty rate. That's why, because uh, TensorFlow didn't show a high certainty rate to detect these species. However, we use a uh, very easy to learn methods that can help with uh, catching more mosquitoes and, improve, and providing more data for our deep learning model. So uh, I just want to uh, give an overall conclusion over the deep learning techniques that we use for these three chapters. As I showed, they are robust, efficient, and flexible. And I'm saying flexible because we apply them on different taxa and different projects, the different uh, quality of images or recordings. And also they are able to accurately and efficiently address challenging questions in different, different fields of biology. Okay, here I am done with my dissertation. But what I really like to do is that I show you three straightforward practical examples of using TensorFlow. And there are other examples that I'm gonna keep using them in the future. My postdoc is going to be like monitoring North American uh, bat species. The, the NSF pro proposal that we just submitted is going to be based on uh, Mexican birds. And those are the very practical, straightforward applications that we can have for using deep learning techniques. But I'd like to, to show you some more, uh, some, I should say, complex, cool ideas that we also can apply uh, deep learning techniques and their applications to see how these models would do with those questions. I just want you to bear with me because these ideas are very different. They're very heterogeneous, but I'm gonna connect them, at, connect them together at the end. The first idea is cryptic species. As you know, cryptic species, there are different like, uh, forms. Some of them are indistinguishable morphologically and we need to, use, we need to sequence their DNAs. Some others, we need experts and like tra well-trained people to be able to tell them apart. And as I showed you, we had some of those groups in my dissertation and the deep learning technique was, uh, was successful in identifying them. 
these two are probably not considered as cryptic species, but they're phylogenetically closely related. And even their calls were similar, but still TensorFlow was able to tell them apart with these two rates. The other idea, as I told you, very different is kin selection. Kin selection is the, is the behavior that one individual shows in the population is that if I self-sacrifice my opportunity, my chance for reproduction to pass my genes to the, to the next generation, and instead I help another member, another individual that is efficiently and closely related to me. If I benefit so much that covers the cost that I avoided reproduction, then that formula, that equation would work and that species would help other individuals and would become donor versus the recipient that they received the help. And this is showing that if we, uh, we have a degree of genetic relatedness times the benefit that, that the species achieve, if it's higher than the cost, then the kin selection would happen. Here I want to show you an example that uh, it's a Florida scrub jay. Uh, they're dear and near to town's heart. He's very excited about those species. Actually, this image, this picture was uh, was taken by a uh, town's PhD advisor, John Fitzpatrick. And as you can see, the seven-year-old daughter is helping her mom and her stepfather to take care of their kids instead of doing the reproduction by her own. Another example, it's mimicry. We have two types of uh, mimicry, Batesian mimicry and Mullerian mimicry. Batesian mimicry is that when we, are, we have one species that is harmful and another species that is harmless. So that species that is harmless tries to mimic the model, which is this, the harmful species, because they share one predator and the, the mimic species wants to avoid the cause because of that predator, if they follow the same pattern and coloration that the model species has. The Mullerian mimicry is a different type of behavior. It's that two or three or more species because they share a, a common predator and there are actually all of them harmful. They decide to develop the same patterns to kind of create a mutual benefit and, and decrease the load of the cost they have per species by those predators. And here you can see examples of that, that we have uh, uh, the wasp and the bee that they were showing the, the real signal, the honest signal, and this is a mammalian mimic. On the other hand, we have a fly that is mimicking one of these models and is actually showing a fake signal. And this is Batesian mimicry, and this is Mullerian mimicry. Here are other examples regarding this topic that we have like moth, bee, flies, that they are like following the same patterns uh, with the same purpose. As I said, the, the three different topics that I, or ideas that I showed you, there's something in common among all those three ideas that connect them together is that so far, any information we have about those three ideas. One of them is related to taxonomy, the other one is related to behavioral ecology, and the other one is related to evolutionary ecology, is that it's based on human perception. Human perception is subjective and it's also biased. But the thing I'm thinking for the future to explore more using those techniques, deep learning techniques, is that what information is there that one individual can perceive that and see and understand or tell apart the member of the family, the kin versus the non-kin? Or what informations are there that like a smart predator can tell apart between uh, a mimic and a model or the information between a good mimic or a bad mimic? And if we use these techniques and these, uh, these models, they're objective, they quantify the information that we can achieve uh, from those ideas, and they're non-dependent on human perception systems. So this, I show you that for the future path or the future next few years, 
I would, I would like to explore those techniques with those biological concepts to see what type of information we can achieve using these models. At the end, I want to thank my advisor, Tom Peterson. He gave me the freedom to explore uh, these new techniques and also for like a time he dedicated to my project, also for my committee member, uh, Rafe Brown, Jorge, Rob, and Perry, and the former member, Craig Martin, that for their uh, time dedication and valuable, uh, valuable pieces of advice they provided during my uh, five year of PhD. Also, I want to specifically thank Perry Alexander and Ed Kamp for the computational part of this project, that they were, uh, they trained me how to code and program like a programmer. They were very patient with me. And they also suggested the importance of using deep learning techniques. And as I mentioned in the past for the three chapters, uh, Janine Rodrigo, medical entomologist, experts on triatomines for chapter one, Rafe and Joanna for chapter two, Nathan, Kofi, Lindsay, Ram, and the many people that we had in the mosquito collection team for chapter three. So, and at the end, I wanna thank the KUENM group uh, that they are lovely, uh, lovely people and they create a very friendly uh, environment that they can work in that and we enjoyed the past five years working with these people. And of course, these pictures are not for this year. I really miss those moments that we were able to go out after work and have dinner together. Hopefully, we're gonna have those moments back again soon. And now I would like to uh, kind of like discuss a little bit the research and if you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to unmute yourself or send the questions to Tom or Spencer.